On September 1st, 1939, Poland will become the first country attacked by Nazi Germany, and this will cause many wars around the world to explode into a new world war. But what was so special about Poland that it was worth another global war? Perhaps we can find a hint in the events of 1921, when Poland achieves more or less the borders that it will have until that fateful day 18 years later. Welcome to Between Two Wars, a chronological summary of the interwar years, covering all facets of life, the uncertainty, hedonism and euphoria, and ultimately humanity's descent into the darkness of the Second World War. I'm Indy Nidell. As we saw previously, the new post-World War nations in Eastern Europe have been desperately battling the Bolshevik Russian attempt to put the broken Russian Empire back together in a new form. By the end of 1920, Ukraine and Belarus have, only months after their creation, fallen to the Bolsheviks, but Poland, Finland, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia have defended their independence. The outcome has been very uncertain, especially for Poland and Lithuania. They were, in fact, at war with each other while they also fought the Bolsheviks. The 1920 Versailles Treaty added substantial land dependencies to the small, landlocked Polish Republic that had been proclaimed in 1918. Parts of West Prussia and all of Posen are now parts of Poland. The northern expanse of West Prussia is divided from East Prussia to create the Polish Corridor, giving Poland access to the Baltic Sea and establishing the autonomous but adjoined seaport at the now free city of Danzig. On the 11th of July, 1920, the rest of East Prussia around Königsberg is allowed to decide by plebiscite where to go. A majority of 97% vote to stay in Germany. And East Prussia is now a German island squeezed in between Poland in the west and Lithuania in the east. A sliver of the region on the northern side of the Memel River remains under the administration of the League of Nations, awaiting a decision if it will go to Lithuania or stay in Germany. By 1923, the decision still will not have been made, and Lithuania decides to just take it. On the southwestern Polish-Czechoslovakian-German border, Upper Silesia is partly ceded to Czechoslovakia, and the rest is also to decide by plebiscite where to belong. Problem is, there's no clear sign which way the population there wants to go. But before we get there, we have to backtrack a bit, okay? If you watched the first episode of this series, Rise of the Nations, we explained how the idea of national identity is its a very new concept here in the early 20th century. We also explained how history was adapted to a nationalist narrative, creating some very confusing historical discrepancies. The Poland of 1921 is a perfect example of how this now causes problems that already lead to war and will be a central factor in the conflict that erupts in 1939 in this very place. Now, although Poland is only three years old in 1921, it has existed in the past, at least in name. For hundreds of years, the region had been the dependencies of the Polish crown. Now, we should be careful of mixing that up with the idea of Poland as a nation state. For the Poland of the past was nothing like the Poland of the present. But there was something very special about that region that was remarkably modern already in the 14th century. Formally, the region was called the Crown of the Kingdom of Poland and Grand Duchy of Lithuania, colloquially the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. By 1619, this was one of the largest monarchies of Europe, with an area of more than a million square kilometers and a population of 12 million people, roughly 15% of Europe's population. The language mix of this population was extremely diverse, with an estimated 38% speaking some variety of Polish and more than 15% speaking some kind of German, out of which a third were Yiddish-speaking Jews. Remember that for future episodes. It'll turn out to be very important. But this in itself wasn't modern. Diversity was the norm at that time. The Commonwealth was special because it actually had the seeds of constitutionalism and parliamentarianism at its heart. The monarch had only limited powers, which were checked by a bicameral legislature, the same, which was elected by the nobility, the Schlachta. Now, at this time, other monarchies like England or Sweden were, were drifting in this direction, but in the Commonwealth, this was already a functioning system. Starting with the Thirty Years' War, the Commonwealth came under increasing pressure. The Habsburgs, the Holy Roman Imperial family, 
the Romanovs, the Russian imperial family, and two families with strong ties to the Commonwealth, the Vosses and the Hohenzollerns, vied for control. In fact, one of the Vosses, Sigismund III, sat on the thrones of Poland, Lithuania, and Sweden simultaneously, and the Hohenzollerns were part of the Commonwealth through their dependency, Prussia. When the Commonwealth reaches its greatest extent in 1619, these families start tearing the Commonwealth apart through a long series of bloody wars and diplomatic shenanigans, and by 1795, it is no more. By then divided between the Habsburgs, the Hohenzollerns, and the Romanovs. By the end of the 19th century, this means that the region is part of Austria-Hungary, Russia, and Germany. And in 1914, it becomes the northern part of the Eastern Front. But before that war broke out, there was a growing movement for a new independent Poland, a movement that gained significant traction towards the end of the 19th century. By the turn of the 20th century, one man has emerged as the leader of that movement, Józef Pilsudski. He's a multilingual Russian citizen of Polish ethnicity with a vision of a resurrected Commonwealth stretching from the Oder to the Baltic Highlands and from the Baltic Sea to Crimea. It's important to note that Pilsudski's dream is not based on identity politics. Rather, he wants to resurrect a modernized, democratic version of the multi-ethnic commonwealth. He's opposed by the nationalists who envision a smaller, but more ethnically pure Poland. Pilsudski has begun raising a private Polish militia already before the World War. And when it comes, he puts his forces at the disposal of the central powers hoping that a defeat of Russia will enable him to carve out a new nation and use the instability in Russia to expand it eastward. When the Russian Revolution starts in 1917, he demands and gets a Polish nation. Well, on paper. It's not truly autonomous, not really even close, and he refuses to cooperate with the Germans and is imprisoned. Days before the war ends, the Germans send Pilsudski to Warsaw in the hope that he will craft a friendly nation that will serve as a bulwark against Bolshevik Russia. This enables him to proclaim a new nation. The name he chooses, the Second Republic of Poland, is a historical reference. The Polish name of the Commonwealth is more correctly translated as the Republic. So basically he's very clever and cements the idea that Poland is ancient already in the name and therefore creates a direct link to the Commonwealth. Soon, Pilsudski sets out on his adventure to recreate the Commonwealth, launching a war against the also recently proclaimed independent nations of Lithuania, Western Ukraine, and the Ukrainian National Republic to forcibly incorporate them all into his new republic. What happens with the Ukrainian adventure you can see in our episodes covering the Russian Civil War and the Polish-Soviet War. The Polish-Lithuanian War turns out to be a rather messy affair as well, but has a somewhat more even outcome. Just like Ukraine had, the Lithuanians face several enemies at the same time. In the east, the Bolsheviks are trying to force them into the Lithuanian Belarusian Soviet Republic. In the west, well, there's a confusing situation. A certain Pavel Bermont Avalov, a German-backed Cossack warlord, yep, has started an independent private war. But against who? The funny thing is, this is still an issue of debate in 2018. Did he want to help the Lithuanians against the Poles and the Bolsheviks? expand Germany, or maybe even create a kingdom for himself. In any case, he's defeated and disappears into the backwaters of history. But before that, he does distract the Lithuanians enough for the Poles to use that confusion to incite insurgencies against the Lithuanian government. In 1919, as the Red Army advances into Belarus, Poland steps in with support for the private militias that are popping up all over the place. What follows is a long series of back and forth with confusing alliances, uprisings, counter-uprisings, and minor battles with out unclear outcomes. The major battles are actually between Poland and the Bolsheviks, but the Lithuanians constantly get caught in the crossfire. What's actually going on is so confusing and so subjective that, and this is serious, if you compare Polish and Lithuanian history books, the same battle is still today likely to be attributed to completely different wars. And Polish and Lithuanian historiography doesn't even agree on the time frame of all of this. In the end, the chaos is, to a certain degree, helpful in keeping the Bolsheviks out. And when the Polish army is in retreat in early 1920, the Lithuanians take the opportunity to make peace with the Russians. The Lithuanians secure their territory from the retreating Polish army in the summer of 1920, but 
when the Polish strike back after the Battle of Warsaw in September. They claim that Lithuania is a Russian ally and attack the Red Army and the Lithuanians at the same time and defeat both at the Battle of Niemen River. Lithuania is now open to invasion, but the League of Nations forces through the Slovakia Agreement, where the Poles agree to Lithuanian independence. The agreement is not clear about the demarcation line in the Vilnius area, though, and Pilsudski orders his army to take the city under the guise of protecting the independence of ethnic Poles in Vilnius. So the capital of Lithuania is now in Poland. The Lithuanian government will be set up in Kaunas instead, and the Poles and Lithuanians will not have diplomatic relations until shortly before World War II. Instead of becoming a commonwealth, the two new nations have now become bitter enemies. But Poland is not only facing problems in the East. While the Paris Peace Conference gets underway, ethnic Poles in Posen, still in Germany, rise up against the Germans but are violently crushed. This contributes to the incorporation of Posen into Poland under the Treaty of Versailles, but the treaty doesn't finally decide the fate of neighboring Upper Silesia. This region has a larger ethnic diversity, with like 53% Polish speakers and 40% German speakers, and the population is pretty much divided down the middle about where to go. In early 1920, ethnic German militias, the SIPO, start a campaign to violently dissuade the Polish-speaking Upper Silesians from joining Poland. The militias harass Polish-language newspapers and activists for Polish annexation. The Polish population answers with demands to dissolve the SIPO. On May 3rd, on the anniversary of the Polish Constitution, the SIPO attack at Polish celebrations all over the region. In June, July, and August, tensions continue to rise. On August 17th, three days after the Polish army's victory over the Bolsheviks at the Miracle at the Vistula, German newspapers spread the fake news that Warsaw has in fact fallen to the Soviets. The SIPO uses the news to again attack what they now call Polish insurgents, but the Polish strike back, and in late August some 2,000 Polish militia successively take control of one town after the other. This is the first step in a concerted effort to take the whole region and force the disbanding of the SIPO. On September 27, 1920, the actual Second Silesian Uprising begins. First, the Poles call a general strike. Covered by the chaos of the strikes, forces led by Alphonse Rakoji Zerzebniok destroy the entire communication infrastructure of the region to stop the Germans from coordinating a response. The insurgents then wage skirmishes all over the region to intimidate the German-speaking population. The uprising succeeds. A mixed Polish-German police force is introduced, and the militias on both sides are disbanded. Although the Polish militia continues to exist clandestinely in the guise of a sport association under the new name Headquarters of Physical Education. The plebiscite can go ahead, but before it does, both sides come up with a new trick. They start bringing in ethnic Poles and ethnic Germans that were born in Silesia but have since moved away. By the rules of the plebiscite, these people can vote as long as they move back home. The population of Upper Silesia suddenly increases by over 20% to over 2 million people. In the end, the vote comes out with a majority of over 59% for staying in Germany. Regionally, the results are very different, with some areas voting with huge majorities to go with Poland and others the opposite. Also, the plebiscite was only supposed to happen for the regions with Polish language majority, but was then extended to the whole region. Enraged by all the machinations and attempts at manipulation, although to be fair, both sides were trying to manipulate the results, Polish militias reemerge and start the third Silesian uprising. The whole affair causes uproar all over Poland, Germany, and in diplomatic circles worldwide. Finally, instead of keeping the whole region in Germany, the Inter-Allied Commission on Upper Silesia decides to split the region with the eastern parts going to Poland and the western parts remaining in Germany. Two problems though. First, there are still ethnic Poles in Germany and ethnic Germans in Poland that feel like they're in the wrong country. And second, the part that goes to Poland is the most valuable part from an industrial and natural resource perspective. So there we are at the end of 1921. And instead of resolving ethnic strife on the borders between Poland and Germany, the impossibility of dividing culturally mixed regions has created tensions that won't disappear over the next 18 years. 
Although Pilsudski has failed to establish a new Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, he has created what looks like a stable Polish Republic that has stood both the tests of international diplomacy and war against a much larger enemy. The wars in Eastern Europe are over, for now, and in the next few years, Poland and the Baltic states will experience growing prosperity and quality of life. But as we shall see, the good years will eventually end in economic depression, fascism, renewed communist agitation, and eventually a new world war that will physically begin in Poland. To get our episodes ahead of time and to support the effort to make more incredible content like this, yeah, I said that, okay, Join the Time Ghost Army on Patreon or directly at the timeghost.tv website. Now there you can also sign up to our forum for free. And if you haven't already, subscribe to Time Ghost and subscribe to World War II on YouTube. World War II week by week starts September 1st, 2018. And if you missed the episode of Between Two Wars about the Polish-Soviet War and the miracle at the Vistula, which is a really exciting episode, that was one of my favorite ones, it's right here. Okay, see you next time. Nazdrowie.